Happy Sabbath. We're all blessed, right? Not only do we have the Sabbath day in which we can rest and fellowship with our brothers and sisters, but we also have a God who loves us beyond words, beyond understanding, beyond comprehension. And whenever we feel like we're struggling and we're going through rough patches or hard times, we know that we have someone that we can come to, someone in whom we can hide. You are my hiding place. Sabbath, church family. 
good to be back with you in the early stages of spring. Um, and as we begin to see the possibility that uh, the pandemic will end soon. So we are thanking God for that and for uh, being able to um, meet here um, week after week um, and God allowing that um, uh, to, to happen safely for so long. So we praise God for that. We have a lot to cover today. Um, one of, we're going to come back to this. We're going to have a revival for the Southern um, New England Conference Youth Department uh, here. It will be at the church nightly from March 21st to the 27th. I talked to Pastor last night, um, and we're excited to be able to host it. And um, I'll give, we'll show a little video at the end, but um, I just want to, so I don't forget completely, make sure we, re we remind everyone that that is, that will be happening. Um, and we'll get into our word. Our scripture reading comes from the book of John, the 16th chapter. John's chapter 16, starting at verse 33, says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Our message this Sabbath is entitled, The Trouble with Trouble. The Trouble with Trouble. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. I pray now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon this place in double and triple portion. Bind the enemy. Cast out the demons. And Father God, fill us and this place with the person of the Holy Ghost. And Father God, I ask that you make me just a nail on the wall. A rusty, sorry nail, Lord, but upon that nail, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let me not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start in the book of John, the 13th chapter. I'll give you a little bit of background. This is the Last Supper. We're just talking about communion, and we this is, communion is... Um, it was given to us, in a sense, at the Last Supper. Jesus had just talked to his disciples and warned them of the troubles that were coming. He told them that they needed to love each other. And told them that he was going to have to go away. In John 13 and verse 21, the Bible says that after Jesus told them all of this, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall... Betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was one, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. When Jesus announces to his disciples, the 12 of them are there, and he says that one of them is going to betray him, I would imagine the room broke out in pandemonium. Three and a half years, they'd walked with Jesus, worked miracles. Even the disciples worked miracles. Uh, they watched 5,000 men, not including women and children, fed from two loaves, uh, from two fish and, uh, and, and five loaves. Uh, and they watched all the miracles. The deaf could hear, the blind could see. They watched Lazarus get out of the tomb and walk. How could one of them betray Christ? The scripture says in verse 23 that one disciple is leaning on Christ's bosom. And I love how he, this disciple is described. It is the one whom Jesus loved. Now, the only person that kind of writes that is John when he's writing about himself. He never says his own name. He's too humble for that. So he just says the one whom Jesus loved. And this is the one whom Jesus loved. It is John who is writing this great gospel. In fact, when people ask me what, where they should start reading the Bible, my response is always start in the book of John. 
Once you understand who Jesus is, the rest of the Bible makes a whole lot more sense. And this book does that. In fact, I want to show you a little bit of the seating. Um, we often think that they would have been sitting at tables with chairs like we do. But in fact, they would have been sitting around a table like this. They would lay kind of sideways on the floor or, or, or sit um, um, with their legs folded under them around the table. So it makes sense when you say that one of them would kind of be in his bosom. If they were leaning, one of them actually could. In order for our story to make sense, Judas would have been on one side of Jesus. Jesus here, John here, Peter would have just been away here. And they would have been sitting having this supper. John 13, 24 says, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast, John, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? So Peter can't stand it anymore. Peter's kind of a, maybe a little bit of a, of a gossip. He's got to know what's going on. So he whispers over to John, ask him, who's going to betray him? John is right there and just asks the Lord, who is it? Who is going to be the betrayer? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. You would think the secret was out of the bag, but the disciples don't get it. They think, you know, maybe something else is going on. But verse 27 says this, And after the sop, Satan entered into him, entered into Judas. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. If you understand prophecy, there is a reason, there's urgency in this verse of Scripture, because there is a 400... Um, uh, a 490 day, a 70 week prophecy. And in that last week, in the middle of the week, the Messiah is to be cut off. The, the, the prophecy is so precise that there is an exact hour and day that Christ is to be sacrificed as the lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's basically telling Judas, we are on a clock. If you are going to be the one to do it, hurry up. The scripture says that he then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Judas goes into the night on the clock. He goes into the night spiritually into darkness. Jesus then begins to talk to them again. Little children, yet a little while, and I am with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this all men uh, know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So after Judas gets up and walks out, Jesus is, is telling them, listen, you've got to love one another. And let me tell you something. I'll just stick this in here. One of the reasons churches do not succeed in the modern era is because there is often more fighting in church than loving. There's often more jockeying, more envy, envy more jealousy, more uh, difficulty, more strife. If we really come to a place where we can move into love, and I don't mean us here, I mean globally as a church, powerful things begin to happen. Peter again couldn't take it anymore. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, where I go. You cannot follow me, not now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why, can I, why can I, cannot I follow thee now? And here's where our story starts. Peter then says, I will lay down my life for thy sake. Clear if Peter understood what happened with Judas but here he wants to make the point to Jesus that he will go the full length for him. I will lay down my life for you. Jesus said unto him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto you, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. The cock shall not crow. The rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. I'm, I can only imagine... 
the way Peter felt when he heard these words. Peter was a very confident, cocky disciple. In fact, Peter, in my opinion, spends the entire three and a half years before the cross trying to figure out how he can be vice president when Jesus takes over the kingdom. To hear these words was difficult for Peter. And we're going to see that Judas goes in one direction. Peter fails and st still fails, but goes in a different direction. In fact, J Luke gives us a little more color. He says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. I want to submit to you, church, that every day before we get up and go about our business, the enemy is plotting our demise. Do you hear what I said? In fact, the spirit of prophecy tells us that if we could see the battle that was going on between the good angels and the evil angels over our souls, we would never leave our houses. In fact, the enemy is so slick that even today, he is plotting the demise of our children for 10 years from now. Jesus says, Peter, you don't get it. Satan isn't just going to allow you to be what you want to be. It, it, Satan is sifting you like wheat. In other words, he is trying to prepare you not to serve me, but to serve him. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. That your faith fail not. And here is one of the most scathing rebukes. Peter could have received in the last part of verse 32 Jesus then says and when you are converted strengthen your brethren this is mind-blowing here is Peter who followed Jesus gave up everything to follow Jesus followed Jesus again worked the miracles and on the Mount of Transfiguration it's Peter James and John who were asked to go with him Peter met uh, Moses and Elijah and yet when the time comes, when Peter is about to face trouble, Jesus says to him, when you are converted, don't miss this, Peter wasn't converted. Three and a half years with Jesus, all the miracles worked, just like Judas uh, had, had, had shielded himself from all of those blessings by constantly focusing on what he could get uh, out of this relationship with Christ rather than how could he serve Christ in the relationship. Peter had not been converted. Let me tell you something, church. This, when I read this, 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 this gives me pause. I was raised in this church. My mother's grandmother was converted to Adventism on the island of Jamaica a very long time ago. We were raised at the Faith Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we had, and I, I was baptized when I was probably only about 11 years old when Pastor Saunders um, was at the church. And we studied the Bible. You remember, we, I mean, we went into the Word at Faith in those days. Every AY service, we had, we, I mean, our Sabbath school classes were, were often prophecy classes with Brother Lindo and Sister Perry. And I can tell you that like Peter, when I got to a point in my life when I needed to stand on my own two spiritual feet, I found out that with all of that exposure to Christ, I had not been truly converted. It's all right, I'm going to be a bit vulnerable for you all today. Because the danger is that sometimes we think that by dressing up and coming to church, by believing what we believe, that we have fully digested and uh, internalized and expressed. That's what conversion is to me. It's not just that you believe it, but it has become a part of you to the point where you behave completely differently. And the shock is that the church is full of unconverted Peters. Years with Jesus, all the lessons, the Sabbath school, the, the time in the choir, all that we have done. And there are many of us who are still not converted. And we know this because at the slightest trap the enemy sets, we fall in head first. Peter had not been converted. And here, the trouble with trouble is if you're not converted... You won't survive trouble. 
Bible goes, it says it like this. And when he had said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and death. And to death, Luke adds that Peter says, listen, I'll go to prison with you too. Verse 34, and he said, I tell thee, Peter, the clock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Jesus says out to the proof that you're not converted is that you are going to deny you even know me. Never mind go to prison or die for me. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says. Christ triumphant, page 276. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Just before Peter's fall, Christ said to him, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. How true was the Savior's friendship for Peter? How compassionate his warning, but the warning was resented. In self-sufficiency, Peter declared conf confidently that he would never do what Christ had warned him against. Lord, he said, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and into death. His self-confidence proved his ruin. He tempted Satan to tempt him, and he fell under the arts of the wily foe. When Christ needed him most, he stood on the side of the enemy and openly denied his Lord. Self-sufficiency. The idea that I have arrived, that I can uh, take care of myself spiritually. This is uh, literally the most dangerous place the Christian can get to. Because if you are not, I used to say it was day by day, morning by morning. But as I've gotten older, I realize it is moment by moment. When I'm at work, I've got to pause sometimes and go back and read a passage of scripture. I, when I'm at work, sometimes I have to pull into the closet and call on the name of the Lord. I, I don't let my day go with long periods of time when I don't communicate or talk to my God. Because if I do, I become vulnerable. You can intermittently fast from your food, but do not intermittently fast from your God. You see, the trouble with trouble is me. The trouble with trouble is you. It's not the trouble itself, I've learned. I've learned that, in fact, the reason trouble feels so bad is because we are so incapable of dealing with trouble. Our faith is often so weak that when the wind begins to blow slightly, we're ready to pack up and, and leave God. A few weeks ago, I said, you know, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of being in the house. I'm going for a walk. I went and bundled up and put on my clothes, started walking down my street. I got about maybe a quarter of a mile down, and the wind started hitting me in the face. My tears start freezing up. I said, man, this is not California at all. I'm, boy, this, they both start with a C, but these are very different states. I think I'm going to go home. I'll walk in circles around the kitchen or something. I'm not doing this. Some of us, our faith is like that. As soon as the ice cold wind of the trials of this life begin to hit us and the tears begin to freeze on our face, we say, I give up, Lord, I'm going back. You see, the trouble with trouble isn't the trouble. The trouble with trouble is you, it's me, it's us, it's our self sufficiency and our pride. That's the reason Jesus on the ship could sleep when the disciples were worried it was going to sink. I use this analogy all the time. Think about it. They're in the middle of a storm. The boat is filling up with water, and Jesus is fast asleep. The disciples, probably Peter, run to him and say, Lord, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Jesus says, wait a minute. How little faith do you have? He stands up, holds up his hands. Peace be still. The whole thing comes to an end. They marvel at it. But here's the secret. If Jesus is in the vessel, it cannot sink. There's no reason, no matter how, 
y'all missing this thing. No matter how bad your personal storm is right now, no matter how bad they're treating you at school or at work, no matter how much infighting there is in your family or how little money you have in the bank, the truth of the matter is if Jesus is in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. The trouble with trouble isn't the trouble. The trouble is we often do not have Christ in the storm because like Peter, the storms reveal that we have not been converted. In fact, Solomon says it like this. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I, I would read it modernly, more in a more modern way. I'd say pride goes before you, des you are destroyed and an arrogant spirit before a fall. And we live in a time when everybody wants to speak their truth and it's all about me and it's all about pride and this kind of pride and that kind of pride. It's all about me. But let me tell you something. That is not the spiritual formula that allows for the kind of humility that, stop, allow, that, that allows the individual to stop playing the victim and submit to Christ. You see, trouble is less what happens to you as what it shows is in you. It is in trouble that often our true character percolates. It, it comes to the surface. It is in trouble. It is in trial and difficulty when all things seem lost that we show who we are as we see Peter is about to do. It is in the difficulties of life that we begin to know who God is. When I was going through one of the darkest trials in my life, I, and, and I saw how, how I began to wither and, and my strength began to fade, I started to realize that although I thought I had arrived, with enough external pressure, I began to fold up like paper. Trouble shows you who you are. And there's a few reasons why. One of them is when you start to have real trouble, people become your enemy. The danger with making people your enemy is your focus becomes people and not Christ. My Bible tells me that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual powers, against, in fact, spiritual wickedness, the scripture says, in high places. What happens is you start making people your enemy. So you get into difficulty, and what we start to do is blame the person who we see inflicting the pain. And we don't realize that, in fact, this is the work of the enemy. He is trying to sift you like wheat. But as long as your focus is on a purpose, on a person, you think you can deal with a person, and you don't realize you're not dealing with a person. You're, in a, you're involved in spiritual warfare. All your animosity around that individual is misplaced. Now, it doesn't mean you allow the person to, to do you harm, but I want you to get that once you understand this, you will draw closer to Christ. You'll use your energy to draw closer to Christ rather than using your energy to get mad at people. I've learned it's, it's, a, it's pointless to get mad at people. It just does not make sense. My father left my mother when I was two years of age. I told you, I mean, I told you guys, he married my mother's second cousin. And went on and had a whole other family. And my, and, I, and, and my older brother was very angry at him. And it, and it took a toll on him. He was older, so it makes more sense. He had more of a relationship with him. But I, I had to learn not to go there with him. Not to have that anger. Because if I make my father my enemy, I miss the fact that my father's real problem was his lack of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Meaning that if I spend all my energy trying to destroy him or get back at him, in fact, I may become just like him. Don't let people be your enemy. Peter did it. Then John 18, 10, then Simon Peter having a sword. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, after the Last Supper and smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Peter thought people was his enemy. He thought he could defend Jesus in his own strength. So he pulls out a sword and he cuts off this man's ear. Amazingly, Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on him. 
people are not your enemy. In fact, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, don't you realize if I needed to, I could pray to my father and he would send 10,000 angels? Jesus at any time could have called for reinforcement from heaven and wiped the planet out. Instead, he went to the cross so that you and I could be saved. How much power is 10,000 angels, church? You remember in the story of Hezekiah? When the Assyrians were coming and God sent one angel and one angel wiped out 180,000 plus of the Assyrian army? How much damage could 10,000 angels do? You don't have to be afraid of people, church. I know people have done us wrong, but I submit to you, you can forgive people and move on so that you do not become tangled in that web, so that you don't let trouble be your trouble forever. Family members that have done you wrong, exes that have done you wrong, classmates that have done you wrong, co-workers, don't allow people to hold you hostage. Number two, the trouble with trouble is that you begin to doubt God. When you get into deep trouble, a lot of folks say, if God really was with me, I wouldn't be in this kind of trouble. We begin to doubt to God. I know I did. When I went through some terrible things, my name was run through the mud, and, and the whole world seemed like it was against me. I remember asking God, Lord, how could you? How, why, would, why am I in this position? You start to doubt him. You start to question him. And all the devil needs is that seed of doubt. He just needs you to begin to ask that question. But my advice is that when you are facing trouble, the secret is to take your doubt to Christ. Do not allow the enemy to have you uh, have this thing bounce around in your mind as to why God would allow this. Satan will use that to take you out. John 18, 25, and Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being the, his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off. So one of Malchus' relatives um, is there, and he said, wait a minute, I saw you there. And you know he would remember because he probably cut off his cousin's ear. Did I not see thee in the garden with him? Peter denied again, and immediately the cock crew. You will deny God if you allow trouble to plant the seed of doubt. You begin to question him, and you cannot allow that, especially as we head into the dark time of trouble ahead of us. The third one is this one, and probably one of the most dangerous things about trouble. You begin to allow the enemy to dissolve your own value. You start thinking you're not worth much. Trouble can do that. You start to question yourself. I, I have patience sometimes, and, and literally this is their disease. Their disease is that they have been through so much trauma in life that now they do not see their own value. I remember having a young lady back when I was working in California, and she would cut her wrists, and we would see her from time to time in the urgent care and have to sew them up or, or bandage them or whatever it was. And, and finally one day I was able to really have a conversation with her and ask her, why is it that you would harm yourself? It, it doesn't make sense. What is really going on? She said, I cut myself so that I know I can feel pain. I said, what does that mean? She was like, I don't think I'm worth anything. I don't know that. I'm even worth feeling good. The pain makes me feel like I feel I'm worth. I said, ooh. Let me tell you something, church. One of the things the devil wants to do is make you believe you are not worth what Christ has done for you. And I had to explain to that young lady the price that was paid for her. Spiritually, you are priceless. We are all invaluable because God uh, came in the form of human flesh in the person of Christ Jesus to die for you. And here it is, church. If it was just you who needed to be saved, he would have still come. The devil wants trouble to make you think you have no value because other people treat you like trash. The devil wants you to believe you are trash. But the devil is a liar, church. He's the father of lies. Mark 14, 69 says it like this. 
and a maid saw him again, and, he, and, be, and I began to say to them that stood by, this is one of them. And he denied it again. This is Peter. And a little after, they stood by, said, uh, to, uh, they that stood by said again to Peter, surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. And look at what he starts to do here. Devalues himself. But he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. They said, your speech is like the Galileans. It's a bit more noble of a speech. We know you don't speak like the common uh, 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 person who, who has no uh, nobility, no, no morality. And Peter, to prove his point, devalues himself by cursing and swearing. Here's what Ellen White says. Christ Object Lessons, page 154. The evil that led to Peter's fall and that shut out the Pharisee from, from communion with God is proving the ruin of thousands today. There's nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to, human, to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless the most incurable. God allows us to go into trouble, as we're going to see, to get us through this. But here's, look at how Jesus responds. Another vantage point on the same story, Luke twenty two sixty, 60. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while yet he spoke, the cock crew. Look at verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. Look at verse 62. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. In that moment, Peter realized he wasn't so strong as he thought he was. He, wasn't really, he didn't really have Christ back the way he, he said he did. He went out and he wept. And this is what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Christ Trump from page 276. But even when Peter was denying him, Christ showed that he still loved him. In the judgment hall, surrounded by those who were clamoring for his life, Jesus thought of his suffering, earing disciple, and turning. He looked at him. In that look, Peter read the Savior's love and compassion. Don't miss this, church. And a tide of memories rushed over him. He saw that he was doing the very thing that he had declared he would not do. Once more, he looked at his master and saw a sacrilegious hand raised to smite him in the face. Unable longer to endure the scene, he rushed, heartbroken from the hall. He pressed on in solitude and darkness. He knew not and cared not whither. At last, he found himself in Gethsemane. The scene of a few hours before came vividly to his mind. He thought of how the Savior, during his agony in the garden, had come for sympathy and comfort to those who had been so closely connected with him in labor. On the very spot where Jesus poured out his soul in agony, Peter fell upon his face and wished that he might die. Had Peter been left to himself, he would have been overcome. But one who could say, Father, I know that thou hearest me always. One who is mighty to save interceded for him. Christ saves to the uttermost all who call, all who come to him. Many today stand where Peter stood when in self-confidence he declared that he would not deny his Lord. And because of their self-sufficiency, they fall an easy prey to Satan's devices. Those who realize their weakness trust in a power higher than self. And while they look to God, Satan has no power against them. There are, less, there are some lessons that will never be learned except through failure. Peter was a better man after his fall. As fire purifies gold, so Christ purifies his people by temptation and trial. Peter was a better man. After his fall. And let me submit to you. We'll read a couple of these things and we'll be finished. It is because of your trials. That many of us will be saved. 
It is actually the difficulties that keep us on our knees, that draw us to God. In fact, if Peter had not gone through this, Peter may not have been saved, but, a God, but Christ warned him and then allowed him to go through it. Revelation 3 and 19 says it like this. As many as I love, Jesus says, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Spirit, Spirit of Prophecy says, it is his providence that brings us into varying circumstances. In each new position, we meet a different class of temptations. How many times when we are placed in some trying situation, we think this is a wonderful mistake, how I wish I had stayed where I was before. Difficulty comes, trial comes, they're talking bad about you at work or at school or in your family. The difficulty things come and you wish you could just be somewhere else, that you weren't there. How could people be so cruel, you think? The spirit of prophecy says, but why is it that you are not satisfied? It is because your circumstances have served to bring new defects in your character to your notice. But nothing is revealed but that which was in you. The trouble with trouble is us. Our failure to manage the difficulties we're going through, uh, to, to stay firm in Christ, has less to do with the storm than with us in the ship. When trials arise that seem unexplainable, we should not allow our peace to be spoiled. However unjustly we may be treated, let not passion arise. Even though people have treated you terribly, spirit of prophecy, don't allow your passion to arise. By indulging a spirit of retaliation, we injure ourselves. We destroy our own confidence in God and grieve the Holy Spirit. There is by our side a witness, a heavenly messenger, who will lift up for us a standard against the enemy. He will shut us in with the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. And look at this, church. Beyond this, Satan cannot penetrate. He cannot pass this shield of holy light. I don't know what you're going through this Sabbath. I don't know what trouble has reached you. Sometimes we cause our own predicaments and then we question God as to why we're in the mess. Other times we do nothing and trouble finds us. I don't know what your circumstance is, but I want to submit to you that you have a heavenly witness by your side. I want you to understand that right now you are being shut in by lights from heaven. And that there is a limit, a line drawn around each one of us as to how far God will allow the enemy to go, just like he did for Job. You've got to understand he will not give you more than you can bear, but he will give you enough that your trials purify your character. Whatever you're going through, no matter how tough it is, if it's a child that's gone astray, if it's a marriage that seems broken, if it's, if it's, if, if it's a, a family ties that have been crushed, it doesn't matter. What, I'm, what, what needs to be understood is that at all times, ask yourself the question in your trials, what is God trying to teach me? What is it about my character that is so, so uh, dysfunctional, so, so, so fractured, so broken? What is it about my character that the, that the scalpel of trial is being used by the surgeon Christ Jesus to remove the cancer of a bad piece of character from off of me? What is it that God is trying to remove? And then pray and ask God, help me, Lord, to be Submissive, humble, teachable. Allow me, Lord, to not be so self-sufficient that I don't allow the work that you're trying to do in this trial to have its full work. To finish up the story, after Jesus is resurrected in John chapter 21 and verse 15, it says, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Lord, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. Now, notice that he says, do you love me more than everybody else, Peter, all the other disciples? Notice how different Peter's response is now. Lord, you know I love you. Not, I'll go all the way, I'll fight the armies, I'll die for you. Lord, you know I love you. Very different Peter now. 
He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith to him, unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Jesus asks him three times if he loves him so that publicly in front of the other disciples, after they all knew Peter denied him, he would have three chances to state his allegiance and love for Christ. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verse 18 says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he, Peter, should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. I want you to get this. After Jesus uh, tells Peter the first time, you're going to deny me. Now he comes back to Peter and he's able to say to Peter, listen, do you love me? Three times Peter says, yes. In fact, Peter is grieved. He's embarrassed as Jesus asks him the third time. But Jesus does something else, church. Each time he tells him to feed his sheep, feed my lamb. And, and he then says, you're going to be a leader, Peter. Literally, he says to Peter, you have been so restored that you're going to lead. And Peter leads after Christ is gone. And Peter doesn't say he would die for Christ. This time, Christ tells Peter, you're going to die for me. You're going to be led to and fro. And they say it speaks to the, to the, to the, the death of that Peter would have is what John says here. And yes, we know the tradition states that Peter was then crucified upside down. He glorified Christ in his final act after helping to build the church. Let me tell you this. If you have, I don't care how far in your life you have traveled from God. I don't care how many mistakes you have made. I want to submit to you that if Peter after denying him three times publicly, cursing and swearing his denial could be accepted back by Jesus Christ. You have not gone so far that Jesus won't accept you back. Acts of the Apostles, page 467, says it like this. It is the triumph of the Christian faith that enables its followers to suffer and be strong to submit, and thus to conquer. It is the triumph of the Christian faith that it enables its followers to suffer and be strong, to submit, and thus to conquer. I don't know what trials you're going through today, church. I don't know what difficulties you have. But I want to tell you that in your trial, you can find victory. It is in the storm that you can find Christ. It was in the fire that Nebuchadnezzar set up that the three Hebrew boys were able to walk with the pre-incarnate Christ. I don't know what trial you're going through. I don't know how horribly you failed the God of the universe. I don't know what it is that's haunting you right now. I don't know what your past look like, looks like, but I can tell you that like Peter, if you're willing to say that you love him, to be converted and to follow him, he has a plan for your life. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. I'll close with this story. But God will use even our arrogance to propel us. When I was finishing medical school, I decided I wanted to stay in South Florida. I went to the University of Miami. I want to stay in South Florida to, to, um, to do residency. But God had a different plan. I never consulted with God. Uh, I just liked Miami, so I figured it's where I would stay forever. And when I went to do what we call the match, which is actually this time of the year in medical school, you have to, each medical student has to find a hospital to take them, to train them, right? 
So it's a, it's a very stressful thing. You take boards, and your board scores matter, your grades matter. You apply to different hospitals. I, I was applying for family medicine and thought, you know, there's no real risk. I can just apply to one here in South Florida. And I, and I did apply to one up in Huntsville, just in case I, I could at least go back and be comfortable uh, near Oakwood College, now Oakwood University. When match day came and everyone else, when they announced, made the announcement of who matched, then two days later you find out where you matched. But when they made the announcement of who matched, I didn't match. I was so secure. I was so, I was so sure. In my arrogance, I was embarrassed. It was very embarrassing to not match into family medicine. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was panicked. So the next day you have to go and, they, and you have to go through what they call the scramble. I don't know how they do this now, but back then there was a giant book. One of my classmates came with me for like emotional support, I guess is why they make them go with you because it's so stressful. And there's this giant book, I mean a huge book, every hospital in America, all the U.S. territories that did not fill all their positions, now you can just call them, interview over the phone, and see if they'll accept you or if they want to fly you out to meet you or how it works. In the, in the last minute, you get a chance to find a hospital. And so my, my classmate is with me. I remember Felicia, she's, she was with me. And, I, and I'm looking through this book, and I, I, I didn't even start looking through the book. They handed me the book, and I opened the book, and it fell open to um, the pages that said Preventive Medicine, Public Health. I had never even heard of this specialty. Never even heard of it. And it fell open, and when it fell open, the first program listed was Loma Linda University. And I know people laugh at me when I say this, but light came from the page. Oh. <laughs> and I told Felicia, I said, that's where I'm going. And sure enough, she, she said, you're crazy. How do you know that? You haven't even called them yet. I said, nah, this is where God wants to send me. I made the call and spoke to the the, the program coordinator, Ida Foster from South Africa, and she said, we never take anyone that doesn't, hadn't, hasn't gone to Loma Linda. She put me on the phone with the program coordinator, Dr. Linda Ferry, and basically the rest is history. You see, God will often, he's so merciful, he will even use our arrogance to direct us in the direction he wants us to go. I want to challenge you that when you face your trial, ask him, where are you sending me, Lord? What do you want me to do? And I'm telling you, I, all the things I've done from serving presidents of the United States and, and centers for disease control and traveling the globe, none of it would have ever been possible had I done what I wanted to do. But what does God want you to do? What is your trouble? What is your difficulty? Where is it directing you? Ask God. Trust God, church. Like the song was sung before I got up to, to speak. Remember that whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the story of Peter. Lord, what a miserable failure he turned out to be, denying you three times after he swore he wouldn't. He watched the demise of Judas at the table, and yet Peter followed suit. Father God, I pray right now that like Peter, we would weep bitterly. We would throw ourselves on the ground of Gethsemane, that we would call on your name and that we would each and all be truly, completely converted. But Father God, one day you will ask us again, do you love me? And I pray, Lord, that on the sea of glass or on the streets of gold or wherever it is that we, we run into you, that any time you ask us, Lord, we would have lived a life that shows we loved you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Alex is going to show a 
short promo video for the week of prayer. We ask you to come and sit with us um, during that time as well. It's time for us to stop playing with God and take him seriously. Time is running out. You, I know you see it. And as we stand on the precipice of eternity, are you ready for Jesus to come? That's the question. And everything we do is either preparing us for the seal of the living God or is preparing us for the mark of the beast. We get to choose. him this morning is hymn number 608 faith is the victory we ask that you please stand for the benediction. Father God, we thank you for the story of Peter, a story of restoration and redemption. Lord, I ask that each one of us, as we go into what is often called this Easter season, the world remembers your death, burial, and resurrection. Help us to remember the power that is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, let not one of us think 
that we have gone so far from you that we are not worth saving. And Lord, help us to tell others that faith is the victory Amen. that overcomes the world. Amen. Amen. Just a quick announcement. Um, I was told that tomorrow South New England Conference will 